Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Look what I'm doing. I'm trying to block so you're not blinded by this little light with the little microphone. How about that? <laughs> welcome to The Reason We Learn. Um, welcome to Dissident Dispatch uh, on a Monday. You guys like this time? If you like this time, maybe I'll just switch it to this time and no more canceling the Sunday so I can do it on Monday. Um, if you're new to the channel, as always, please consider subscribing. Definitely like and share this broadcast so more people can join us live to talk about this important topic of parental alienation in our schools and our doctor's offices and our hospitals. Very important topic. Um, if you're a subscriber or a member or one of my other supporters, bless you. Thank you for coming. You make this all possible. I see many of you here and I'm just so grateful that you're here. So um, I'm smiling and I'm all upbeat and everything, but the topic I'm about to talk to you about makes me very very sad and anxious and upset. But I'm hoping that by sharing this information with you and with others, uh, we can begin to fight back and, you know, assert parental rights, assert human rights and all the things we need to do to protect children. Today's topic uh, is one I want to bring to you this way as parental alienation, because it doesn't get talked about enough. And I think it's a, been a problem for quite some time in America. What do I mean by parental alienation? I mean, people other than parents, I'm not talking about in terms of family court In family court, parental alienation is one parent or the other is trying to alienate the other parent. It's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about people who are outside the family triangulating and trying to cast doubt on the parent-child relationship, trying to get between parents and children, trying to isolate other children away from parents or parents away from children for the purpose of making it easier to persuade, manipulate, groom um, the child into doing what this other party wants them to do. So I look like a judge. No, actually, this is my Artemis sweatshirt from, you know, the moon launch that was supposed to happen. <laughs> it's now delayed again. No, this is my Artemis sweatshirt from NASA, but thank you. I feel a little judge-like um, because I do judge the people doing this very harshly. I hope that history will judge them very harshly. And I definitely think that we should too. Um, I feel confident asserting myself in that role of judge and jury <laughs> because I'm a parent. And I've actually been through some of what I'm going to describe to you today, not in the context of having a child uh, profess to be a gender or a sex other than the one they were born, but because I have dealt with the medical profession and my children, and this goes on, parents, with other things. It's not just the gender issue. Increasingly over the last decade, doctors have been asserting a kind of parental intrusive role um, when it comes to uh, pediatrics and in particular adolescent pediatrics. Now, before we move on, I want to say to those out there in the medical profession, I understand that you see a lot of things I don't see on a daily basis. You probably do see child abuse. You probably do see children who are afraid to tell you things in front of their parents because their parents are being abusive. That said, I genuinely believe there are better ways to train doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, all the people involved in that, as well as teachers, to recognize the signs of abuse, to, you know, kind of raise the red flags appropriately without assuming guilt. So as the title of the show says, there's a presumption of guilt. There's a, you know, better safe than sorry Let's go at the kid alone um, because what if we miss something? And what I want to say is, what if you presume something, you project something, 
And by doing so, you create a problem that was never there before. You create a problem between the parent and the child. You exacerbate any mental illness that is present. And you, you know, actually do harm where you meant to do good. So I don't want to suggest that every single person in the medical profession or even in the teaching profession who has ever triangulated or has ever done these things, thinking they were protecting children from potentially abusive parents have ill intent. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the decision to treat children from 13 years of age onward, it's about that age, as if they're adults, as if they can make competent decisions about their medical care, as if they are competent to interact with other adults like teachers, counselors, principals, what have you at school, without their parents present, I think that decision was terrible because in so doing, they have opened the door for some very bad actors who do have agendas to come in and manipulate our children and destroy the parent-child relationship. So it's gotten to the point where medical professionals are now being trained to isolate the parent. They're being trained to intercede. They're being trained to persuade parents to go along with things for children when the children are children. In other words, they're because of the affirmative care model with the trans stuff. Um, and I, I, I'm getting to the point where I really don't like to call it that. I don't like to call it by the vocabulary they are using. I think we are dealing, as Jennifer Billick says, we are dealing with synthetic sexes, synthetic sex surgeries. We are dealing with mental illness and we should call it that. I don't really want to call this, you know, them. I'm not going to call them trans kids because there's no such thing. I'm sure they'll probably try to block me off of YouTube for saying that, but I don't believe that, that there is such a thing. Um, I don't believe there are transgendered people. I think there are people who have something called gender dysphoria. We used to call it, um, something, something else, not just gender dysphoria, but it used to be called like a gender identity disorder. And it was changed. The DSM changed it. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. But I, I really think this affirmative care model has opened Pandora's box when it comes to this kind of parental alienation. And that's what we're going to talk about. So to show you what I'm, you know, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, and some of you may have seen this, and I apologize in advance if it was hard for you to watch the first time, and now I'm going to make you watch it second. For those of you who haven't seen, I think it's important. I hope you'll, you know, uh, forgive me because this is somewhat disturbing information, um, disturbing video, it's disturbing to listen to, but I think it's it's essential, and I hope this plays. This comes from Billboard Chris, so you may be familiar with, he's been on this show. Um, he is one of my heroes. He travels around the country and, and Canada wearing his billboards, trying to have conversations with people on the street about how children cannot consent. Children should not be taking puberty blockers. They are not reversible. They are very damaging. And he is going out there on the street and having civil conversations with people about this to try to protect children. And I think it's very brave of him. And I think we all owe him a debt of gratitude for doing this. Um, but he's also on top of some other stories that are coming through. So this one is from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, otherwise known as CHOP. And by the way, I had some gain issues with my microphone in my last show. So if I'm sounding too loud, will you guys please like raise, you know, raise your hand or something and tell me to like make it more quiet because I'm trying to keep my voice at a level that it, you don't have, you know, highs and lows, but there's something up with the gain. Anyway, he says, this is incredibly hard to watch. Every parent needs to see this. The Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is training staff how to coerce parents to transition their child. Now, there was some pushback on Twitter about the word coerce. And I want to speak to that. We think of the word coerce and we think of someone like, you know, physically pushing you or explicitly saying to you, you must do this. If you don't do this or else bad things will happen in, in a way where it's like, we will make you if you don't agree. And while I understand the criticism, if you've not been in a position as a parent where you have a troubled child and you're facing down people in white lab coats who 
you know, you're, you're, you're worried, you're worried they're going to judge you. You're worried they're wondering what you did to cause this. All parents, every time our kids are sick or anything's wrong with them, we start wondering, you know, who's going to think it's my fault? You know, like, what did I do wrong? We're already blaming ourselves. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong that my kid is sad? My kid is depressed. My kid is even physically ill. Okay, what did I do that I could have prevented this? So you're already a little on your guard and you're feeling a little defensive and protective of yourself and protective of your child, protective of your family. It's natural. And especially when you add in the fact that we have DSS and state mandatory reporting and we've seen how hair trigger people are about suspecting abuse. I think parents immediately get into a defensive posture. So it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to intimidate a parent. Uh, partly because they love their child and they want them to be well. And if they are not medical professionals and they don't have a lot of background in this area, somebody comes and says, your child might die. Your child, would you rather have a dead child or, you know, you know, would you rather have uh, a dead child or a living child who's trans or whatever? And that is a form of manipulation. And some would say coercion. It's a kind of emotional coercion. It's not physical or legal necessarily, but I want you to think about when you listen to this, think about what would happen if the parent involved in these role-playing exercises, if this were real, and if the parent said, no, not listening to any of you, we're not doing this, and we're leaving now. Because presumably this is a minor child, it's still a minor. Now, the, the actors, the people playing this are adults, but imagine that they're training them to deal with teenagers. So let's say it's a 15-year-old. And the mom says, I'm out. You people are, I'm not doing what you say. I am reasonably certain something would follow after that. Some kind of reporting, some documentation that mom is non-compliant, that mom is a, being is oppressing the child in some way. They might not use the word oppress, but they would put down that, you know, the, that the mom is a problem. Okay. So let's take a look at this first one. What you're going to hear is this train, this person is, uh, I believe a trainee practicing with this mock patient and interviewing them about their feelings about an eating disorder. And let me know, let's see, I don't, sometimes these things don't play right away. So I've got to refresh it. Okay. Um, so tell me, does your mom know about this? Well, my mom's really unhappy about this, and she doesn't know about my friends calling me Amanda. Okay. So you're telling me this today, and I'm wondering if you want some help from us to help your mom understand what's going on with you. Yeah, I need help. Um, my mom won't listen to me or my therapist, and it's just all getting worse. What do you mean by it's getting all worse? I don't want to look like a guy, and I don't want to get big. And... Since my mom won't help me get hormones, I don't like to eat so that I'll stay skinny and more female. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so you're not eating because you want to look feminine and feel more feminine? Yeah, it's kind of stupid. It's not stupid, but I would say that it's getting a little bit dangerous. Today you fainted, which is letting your heart know that it's not getting the nutrition it needs um, to keep up. So... I'm really glad you're telling me this because I think that we can really start to help you. What made you feel safe enough that you could tell us this today, Amanda? Well, you asked about my name and my pronouns and people who know about this stuff know to ask that. I'm so glad that I asked and I'm really glad that you shared this with me today. So here's the plan. I'm going to go and talk to the team and let them know this information. You're going to see us talking and we'll be talking about you. And we're going to come up with a plan to help your mom get on board. When parents aren't on board, sometimes we have to take baby steps. Um, so since your mom doesn't know that we call you Amanda, um, she might use your other name. Is that okay if we use that name when we're talking to her? Yeah, I think my mom's really unhappy about this. So you can just use Jacob with her. Thank you. Thanks for your permission. Okay, I'll do everything I can help. Okay. So again, this is Children's Hospital. We're not dealing with adults. There are several things that I want to call to your attention. You may have already noticed them. One was that this person, whoever they are doing this intake, said, as this supposed patient said, I want to look 
thin and more feminine. I don't want to get big and I don't want to look like a guy. And this person said that makes sense. Voiced an opinion of affirmation for what is, I think we can agree, objectively a self-harming behavior. The, the rationale for the self-harming behavior is, is going to be by definition irrational. So if it's an anorexic, if there were no gender dysphoria going on and it's just an anorexic saying, I don't want to grow up and look like a full grown woman. So I'm not eating. So I don't continue to, so I, I, I don't have breasts. I don't have hips. So I look more like a, a young girl. Would we say that makes sense? to her? No, we wouldn't. I certainly hope we wouldn't. We wouldn't say that makes sense. You would just acknowledge. Okay. And you might even ask, that makes sense to you as a good solution to not wanting to get big, to not wanting to look that way, that that makes sense to you as a solution. And when the person says, yes, that makes sense to me, that is them screaming from the rooftops, I'm sick and I need help. My thoughts are disordered. And I'm not, I'm not thinking clearly. I am coming up with what could be permanent solutions to temporary problems. I'm uncomfortable in my own body. Is not a, it's not a given that's a permanent situation. Yes, you have to permanently live in your body. You don't have to permanently be uncomfortable in it. Lots of us don't like our bodies. Okay. Sometimes it's temporary as far as, you know, we lay, lose weight, we gain weight, whatever. But then there are those of us who just don't like them, period. Wish that we were taller, wish we were shorter, wish we were thinner, wish we were whatever we wish we were. But part of growing up, part of being mature and part of being healthy is coming to terms with what you are. Self-acceptance self used to be one of the goals of therapy. Not coming up with ways to accept the maladaptive coping mechanisms that we come up with to deal with our discomfort in our body. We wouldn't validate the anorexic, and yet this, this boy has an eating disorder. What he's saying is, I have an eating disorder. I'm not eating because I want to look more feminine. That's still an eating disorder, whatever the reasons are. They are not even talking about treating the underlying disorder for the eating disorder. And they're not even discussing, you know, my therapist said, so we're left to believe that the therapist has just been like, I affirm you go get, go to the doctor. That's not therapy. That's telling someone what they want to hear. I don't walk into the therapist's office and say, you know, I, um, I, I identify as a chronically anxious, depressed person. The therapist doesn't go, okay. You're a chronically anxious, depressed person. Awesome. You're in my new friend and client, chronically depressed person. We don't do that. We say, okay, that's that's not conducive to a happy life. Let's let's work on that, right? Um, why are we not looking at gender dysphoria perhaps as a symptom? We're looking at it as like, oh, this is a fait accompli. This this is the problem, and the treatment for the problem is we affirm this, we medicalize it. Boom, we're done. I don't see any therapy in there. And it sounds like most of what they're talking about that might be therapeutic is going to be, let's talk mom into something that mom doesn't want to do. So mom's not being affirmed. Mom, the adult who gave birth to this person, who loves this person, who we should be presuming wants what's best for this child is presumed to be, mm, we're going to help mom take baby steps towards where you are, child. We're going to presume you're correct and mom is incorrect. You're making the right decision. Mom is not. Mom needs to be made to go along. And that's where we're going with this. But it continues. So now the boy in the scenario, is, as Chris points out, you know, has the eating disorder and has recently fainted. So the, all the staff, now when you hear this conversation, this one just, I... They all, they're all horrible, but this, this really blew my mind how, you know, just so confident they are in themselves and their decision and what they're going to do and how, you know, mom so, is an obstacle. So there's another complication. It sounds like mom doesn't know. Amanda really wanted us to know. Um, and she has talked to her therapist about this and tried to broach a topic with mom, but it doesn't sound like she's ready to support her on this level yet. Hmm. Okay. That's going to be complicated. 
we can totally figure this out. I'm going to get permission, and we're going to call the therapist so that they can have a meeting um, and let the therapist know that Amanda has identified that there could be a connection between gender and the eating disorder. Um, we really just need to help mom get on board so that we can get Amanda the help that she needs. So what do you think? Get mom on board. At what point are they going to inquire as to mom's point of view? Does mom have a point of view that's relevant here? Mom who lives every day with this person? Mom who knows more information about what's going on in this person's daily life and the family dynamic and every other thing? They're living it. And they're going to have to live with the consequences of whatever decision Amanda, Jacob, whatever makes. It's going to be mom's insurance paying for it and then mom paying whatever co-pays that go along with this. And yet it's like, we got to get her on board with what the kid wants to do. They're using soft language and, and nice terms to basically say, we need to figure out how to manipulate mom into going along with the teenage child. And us, of course, because we're going along with the teenage child. We're not, no, there's no adults in this room now. Whatever that teenager sitting on that, that bed wanted is what's going to happen. The, we're going to call the therapist and tell the therapist that this person thinks there might be a connection between their eating disorder and the, and a gender thing. Are we, are we going to wait for what the therapist has to say before we get mom on board? I don't see any evidence of treatment happening here. I don't see any evidence of anything therapeutic going on. This entire thing is an exercise in manipulation of the mother. I can do to help. Well, I think that um, you could add the medical piece. And since you know the family really well, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think mom is really supportive and really wants Jacob, I mean, Amanda to be, to feel better and to be more healthy. Um, I'm just going to suggest maybe we talk to mom outside of the room first and just give her this information before we go into the room. Yeah, I just don't think we can ignore the medical piece of this anymore because it's really starting to affect her. I mean, she fainted today, so... Well, I can totally help with that. I think it would be better for me to go talk to Amanda just so that she knows that I know what's going on maybe before mom gets here and then we can. I think I need to go and have a private confab with a minor child before mom's in the room and, you know, get them to trust me even more. So now there's like one person that Amanda trusts or Jacob, whatever, what another person that this the kid trusts. And, you know, we're just, we're all on the same, we're all on the same team. It's us against mom. Subtle. It's sweet. It's we're good. Can I have your permission to talk to your mom? Can I have your permission to use your other pronouns? Can Oh, can I defer to you, child? Uh, make sure that she's okay with us talking to mom outside the room. Great idea. Great. Okay. So that was the, uh, the next piece. So now they've had their little, you know, collab about how they're going to, how they're going to talk to mom outside the room. And so the, the, then the mom, the, the doctor meets with the mom and her, her boy using his real name and, and then asks mom to leave the room. And as he says, the second mom is gone. The doctor uses female name and says the best way to deal with this health is to start a conversation with mom. So the best Bye, way guys. to deal with your health is to convince your mom to do what you want. Let's go back to the anorexic. Let's talk to your mom about how we're going to make sure she can keep you perpetually on a diet so you never gain more weight than you're comfortable gaining. We just don't want you to fate and die. But, you know, we understand that it's, it really does make sense that you don't want to have breasts and hips and you don't want to menstruate anymore. Uh, you know, that makes sense. Um, you know, and the way you want to go about it is by not eating. I'm really wondering at this point, the way they're treating eating disorders, especially if this is the rationale behind it, if they're not suggesting things like puberty blockers to kids with anorexia if because they like the fact that they have amenorrhea. And they're just like, well, you know, let's just give you, well, you know, if you don't want to have periods and you don't want to get breasts and you don't want to do these things, what you're really asking for is to like stop your female. So let's give you some testosterone. Let's put you on hormones. It won't be puberty blockers if already in puberty, but you know, let's let's give you some cross-sex hormones, and you know, maybe then you can have you know, like smaller breasts, deeper voice, whatever. Will that be okay? You'll also burn more calories. Will you feel better about that then? I mean, like this is not therapy. We wouldn't do that with somebody who presented and said, "I just don't want to be a fully fledged woman. I want to stay a little girl." 
Would you put somebody who's anorexic for those reasons on puberty blockers? And just for the record, most anorexics aren't self-aware enough to know that's why they're doing it. In many, many cases, they don't know why they're doing it. It's like a control thing. Sometimes it's a reaction to bullying. Sometimes it's, it's anxiety. It's so many different things. They get started. They can't stop. It's an addiction. But if you press them and if you put words in their mouth, do you like the way you look? Would you prefer to be thin? Why do you prefer to be thin? You might press them hard enough and put enough suggestions that they might say, I like that I don't have a period. I like that I don't have breasts. I like this. I like that. And then what? This isn't, this isn't how we, this isn't how it should be done. So listen to this. You remember me from your last visit. My name is Dr. House, it's Jacob and Janet. Is that right? Yes. So Janet, I'm so sorry to say, I haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk to Jacob or do an exam yet. And I'd like to do that and ask some questions with you outside of the room. Do you think it's okay for me to ask you to grab a cup of coffee while we do that? That would be great. I can't hear Do you think it would be okay for me to ask you to grab a cup of coffee. I honestly, if this were, if this were me, I'd be like, you can ask me. I'm, I, I'm not going to prevent you from speaking. You're, it's okay for you to ask me to grab a cup of coffee. Not going to do it. I'm going to sit right here. I'm going to sit right here. I have a sick child. So yeah, kind of want to know what's going on. Now, if my child asked me to leave, if my child said, hey, mom, I, can I just have, have some privacy to have this exam? I'd maybe think about it. I'm not letting another adult talk over me and tell me to go get a cup of coffee. Like, what is that? And this is happening more and more, by the way, in medical care. You may have noticed if you have children who've hit 13, that you're no longer allowed to access their medical records electronically. You're, you're not allowed to. Weirdly enough, you can call up, you can make appointments, you can bring them to appointments. You can even be in the room for the appointment unless the kid kicks you out. Doctors tend to not kick you out. They'll usually say, do you want mom to leave? They ask the kid. They ask the kid. Do you want your mom to leave? This is what I'm talking about. These subtle little things. Well, if we had such a contentious relationship, I mean, can, do, are, do these professionals have no discernment? They can't see or observe people's behavior and body language when they walk in the office to see that, you know, maybe the kid's really uncomfortable and it's like, do you want some privacy? Would you like to have this exam privately? Or would you want mom present? Okay. That's one way you could do it. Another way you could do it is you could ask the mom, do you want to be present for the exam? Or are you okay stepping out for so that, you know, because remember doctors, doctors um, also abuse patients. That's happened too, especially when it comes to female healthcare. Yeah, that's happened. Mm -hmm. And these are minor children. There are dentists that have abused their patients. So there is a protective reason we parents want to be in the room with doctors also. I don't want to presume them guilty, but you know what? It's my child. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of responsible for them. And presuming that I'm the potential abuser, I'm not going to abuse them right there in the room. Now, if you're saying I might, they, the child might not tell us something because you're in the room, like I said, there's training you can go through to pick up on body language. You can see signs in their health. If they're presenting with depression, then you have an argument. If they're presenting with like severe depression, suicidal ideation, you have an argument. They may not want to tell mom or dad or whatever. So, you you know, they might get more out of them. And, but then, you know, you approach the parent and say, I think it's possible that your child might be more forthcoming about what's going on. If you're not aware of what it is, if, you know, if they have someone different to talk to, we don't want to keep things from you. We just want to see that they get the help they need and they, they just might want to talk to us more, but you know, if there's something you need to know, we will tell you. There are ways you can talk to parents like they're not the enemy and they're not presumed guilty of something and you're not manipulating them. Would it be okay if I asked you to go get a cup of coffee? Right from work, I could really use some coffee. All right, do you need anything? We'll let you know as soon as we're finished. Thank you. All right, thanks. So hi, it's Amanda, is that right? Thank Hi, you so much for gone. sharing that you a different with name. my friend Katie today. That's really, really helpful. It sounds like there's probably a connection with how you feel and what's been going on with your health. It sounds like the most helpful thing we can do today is really start a conversation with your mom. Is that right? I'm thinking the most helpful thing you can do today is find out why the kid doesn't want to be a guy. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe you might want to start a conversation about why not eating is the solution that Jacob has 
decided upon because he doesn't feel comfortable in his own body. Not, I don't feel comfortable in my own body. Well, that's normal. So I've decided not to eat. Oh, okay, that's the only normal, not normal thing. So we'll have a conversation with your mom so you can get on hormones so you can start eating again. They think the problem is that he's not eating because mom won't let him have hormones. Not that he wants to be a girl. Right? Yeah, she's just really unhappy about this. And every time I bring it up, she says it's a phase or that I'm copying my friends and won't talk about it. Okay. I'm just, I don't know what. Maybe she's right ever occur to anybody in this scenario that maybe she's right. Again, this looks like a grown man, but we're talking about somebody at children's hospital. This could be, you know, up to 17 years old, but in, in many cases younger. I'm just copying my, she thinks this, she's like, well, maybe she thinks that because there have been a bunch of kids at your school that have done that. Maybe that would be relevant information. Maybe she thinks that because the last three friends you brought home are also, maybe because you've spent, you know, untold hours on Tumblr. Who knows? Maybe mom thinks that for reasons. It is not for the teenager to decide automatically that mom has no point. That would be something if, if you're the doctor to say, well, you know what? Um, that's interesting information that that's the way your mom feels. Let me go and have a conversation with her. But the conversation is not to get mom on board. The conversation is to say, why do you think this is about social contagion? What evidence do you have? They like, what makes you think that? What makes you, you know, when did this come on? Did this come on suddenly? Or has this been something that he's been talking about since he was, you know, three? I mean, like, what, what is the evolution of this problem? She just thinks that she's like, okay, we got to get her board. It's going to help her right now. Well, I think maybe one of the better things that we can do is have Bree, your nurse, and Katie, the nurse practitioner, and I, have a conversation with your mom, maybe. Best thing we can do is gang up on your mom, three of us together and mom all alone. Yeah, that sounds like a great plan. Outside the room without you to sort of start some things. Would that be okay with you? Yeah. Once again, we and ask I'm the child's try permission. to corral her when she comes back from coffee, okay? Awesome. Corral her because she's livestock. Thank you. So I learned at the therapist that a family session would be a good idea ASAP um, mm -hmm. based on what's what we're doing here today. I had a good conversation with Amanda. She knows that we're going to need to talk to mom. And she gave us permission to talk to mom kind of outside in a different. Permission to talk to mom outside in a different, a different arena. This is a minor child. You don't need the child's permission to talk to mom about the health of the child. Unless, like I said, if you have serious suspicions, but grounded in reason and logic and some kind of evidence that, mom's been abusing this child and that this is going to make things way worse for this child. You don't ask permission from the child to have a conversation with mom about their health. This is like completely insane. And what this tells me is if they're doing this and well, actually I know this happens. Like I said, it's happened to me. I I've, I've, I've been, you know, I've been asked to step out of exam rooms and when I've pushed back gently on it, I've been given this like, look like, why do you want to be in here? And it's like, I don't know. I kind of don't trust you. Why do you want me to leave? And again, we're not talking about situations where, you know, there, there, there's some reason that my kid needs the privacy. Okay. Why do you need to speak to my child alone? It's just weird. For room to start the conversation. Okay, great. Well, hi, mom. Hi. Janet, right? Yeah. It's good to see you again. Hi, we've been talking about you behind your back. It's really good to see you. And I'm so sorry you're here. It's just frustrating. We've been through this so many times. Yeah, I understand. Uh Did you catch that? They go right by that, by the way. We've been here so many times. They're at the hospital. They're at the hospital because the kid has an eating disorder. We've been here so many times. You don't go to the hospital so many times and then have this like, yeah, okay. So moving on towards the hormones of the, no, this is obviously something that she knows a lot about. She's been dealing with it for a long time. They've been, you know, going through this process and these medical professionals have yet to address the underlying cause of the eating disorder. They're just jumping to, oh, it, it's gender. Maybe the gender is the explanation 
for the eating disorder. But we're not ever going to find that out because they've just decided it's the other um, way around. I know this is very complex. I mean, we just want the best for Jacob, as we all do. Um, so I know you've met Dr. House already. This is Katie. She's one of our nurse practitioners. We're just going to ask you, do you want to talk privately in the room? We just had some more information. Why do they do that? This is a feminine thing. I'm sorry. I'm a woman, but the, when I notice women doing women things that make me sick to my stomach, I have to call it out. Do you want to go in and a, be straight with her? We would like to speak with you in another room privately about Jacob, about the situation and the course of treatment we recommend. Do, you don't need to butter her. Would you like to? Does she have a choice? Does she really have a choice? And, you know, I'm the person they hate because I'm the person that when they do this little soft like thing, thing I, I say that. I say things like, do, do I have it? Are you giving me a choice? Because I don't feel like you're giving me a choice. I say that. And then they get all, what's wrong with her? Oh, she's so disagreeable. It's like, no, I just can't deal with people who are insincere and dishonest. I would so much rather they just come right out and say, Let's go in another room and have a conversation about your child and what we're going to do to help give him the care that he needs. Let's do that together. Now we're a team. Do you want any that we got from Jacob today? Sure. sure. Great. Hi, Janet. It's really nice to meet you. I'm Katie. I'm one of the nurse practitioners. Please take a moment to notice the body language. The first one, they're in a tiny space. Hospitals, generally speaking, have places you can go, little conference rooms, little lunch areas, little place. They could, they could go someplace where they're more on equal footing to have what is obviously a very difficult conversation. Instead, we have, you know, she's like mashed in a corner. This one's here. That one's there. And this one's sitting above. And I know people are going to say, you're being nitpicky, Deb. That's all they had in the space, whatever. But again, nothing is by accident. There's a reason there's three of them in one conversation, and yet she's kind of all alone and mushed in a corner. Hi. Um, thanks so much for coming in today and letting me join your team. Um, you have a really incredible child. It's been Oops. And she goes on to say how it's been really frustrating. And I that he identifies as transgender, um, and that's part of why he... He identifies as transgender. No, He's saying he's a girl. He is saying he's a girl. You see how they're, they did that? They're automatically moving into the language of this is, this is a thing. There's this thing out here called transgender. According to them, they've accepted that as a reality. And he identifies as it. There's nowhere to move. There's nowhere for her to go. He has said he's this. Accept it. Why don't you accept it? Instead of, he thinks he's a girl. He wants to be a girl. He is a he. he. He is a he. In terms of his chromosomes, DNA, and body parts, he's male. He says he wants to be a female. Is a completely different thing to say than he identifies as this. Because this isn't a thing. Not in reality. Or she isn't eating. I know this can be a lot to take in, um, but I think we've known each other for a while now and we just want the best for Jacob. And I think we all want his health to be in a better place. This therapist would have been fired so long ago. If this, they've been there multiple times and th this is still ongoing and nobody has ever addressed this as anything other than he identifies as, this is not a therapist. As I said at the outset, this is somebody who is just, you know, occupying an office and getting paid to tell teenagers what they want to hear. And tragically, in some states, it's now the law. In California, you don't have much of a choice. If, you, if you're a therapist and you do not affirm, you can lose your license. You will lose your license. So I did talk to Jacob, too, a little bit by himself, and he was really, really happy to hear that we would all be having this conversation because we want everyone in your family to be taken care of and be on the same page. He was really happy. Well, that's the most important thing. The child who's starving himself to death, the child who has an obvious mental illness, it, it, but he's happy when we tell him these things. So what that's, we've got to keep that going. I don't know what you expect me to do about this. Nothing right now, except for love your child just as you've been doing. And this is just a new layer of information that we have to build a solution. It's not information. They have no new information. 
Um, so, you know, we have to start identifying Jacob as a female. We have to start identifying Jacob as a female. Do you see how the, that transition happened? This is another layer of information. Now we have to do this. What do you expect me to do now? Oh, nothing except love your child, but we have to start identifying your child as a female. Why? According to whom? Is the law of Pennsylvania, is the law in the books that as soon as the child, as soon as a minor child says, I identify as female, that everybody, all the other adults in any kind of official capacity have to stop what they're doing and go along with it? Nobody can say, yeah, we're going to take some time with this and figure out what's going on. No, we have to start doing this. That's how she identifies. Because that's how she identifies. Therefore, it's true. I mean, you know, kid says, this, I know, what What if the next time the kid comes in, well, I'm actually a cat. I'm a cat. Well, you know, we have to start addressing him as a cat because, you know, that's what he identifies as. Need to get a litter box, mom. And here at the hospital, we have um, support of hundreds of families that go through um, transgender. Um, it's a club. Don't worry. Don't worry. You won't be alone. There's all these other people. So now you feel like this is done not only to validate their decision. There's hundreds of other people have gone through this. So it's totally normal. It's not. And you, you won't be alone. Yeah, that wasn't really my major concern. My major concern when my son says he wants to be my daughter and start taking hormones isn't that I'm going to have a little support group to go to. No. My major concern is I don't want that. I don't want that for my child. I don't think it's right. It's not what I want. And I don't, I'm pretty sure I speak for a lot of parents. I don't think I'm the only parent in America who is, does not think that's my first concern. Oh, thank you for making me feel like I'm in a club. What other people do is definitely what I'm worried about. Dangers just like yours. And we also have a clinic that specializes in um, helping families and supporting. We also have a clinic that will help, you know, brainwash you into accepting that which is completely unacceptable to you. So what, you expect me to, like, give him hormones to be a girl and pretend that this is real? We're definitely not saying that is what you have to do. We do want you to connect professionals who know a lot about this. Well, it's nice of them to say, we're definitely, we're not saying you have to do that, but we want you to connect with professionals and know a lot about this implication. You know nothing. And facilitate conversations between you and Jacob to take better care of him. Or to take better care of him. Implication, you're not. So we know not eating is just not an option anymore. Now they get you with the, you don't want him to die, do you? This is what they do. This is what the Trevor Project tried to put forth is, you know, wouldn't you rather have a living daughter than a dead son? Right? It's a false binary. That's so hilarious to me. The same people who say that gender and sex is a false binary throw false binaries at you all the time. It's either dead or transition. Or I don't know, maybe get some actual therapy for the gender dysphoria. Maybe not affirm. Maybe have lots and lots of conversations about what's so wrong with being the gender they are. And, you know, maybe we wait until you're a full-blown adult to make this decision and support you through whatever discomfort it is you're feeling, which is, by the way, a symptom of the disorder. Instead, no. Take better care of him. We're seeing some major issues now with Jacob. And now we have some new information that's going to help us new information see now we can we don't know how to treat eating disorders i can i can attest to that okay been there done that that's been my experience okay they don't know how to eat treat eating disorder they have no idea they'll tell you they do they don't everything they do to treat eating disorders is like maybe this will work well, you know, we'll, we'll do this kind of therapy and we'll make them eat. We'll lock them in a room. We'll force them to eat. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of bully them into eating. They can't leave the table until they eat the food. And if they don't eat the food, they have to drink a shake. And then we'll lock them in a hospital and we'll do all these things. Having seen it as a parent, I can tell you they have no idea what they're doing other than taking your money. The repeat admission rate for eating disorders is off the charts. The amount of money they're making is off the charts. I'm not saying that no one's been helped. 
there are people who go through it and come out and they they get better. But the vast majority of people who get better from an eating disorder get better over time because they had, you know, the love and support of their families and they had a really good therapist and they just slogged it through. And and they made some trips to the hospital in some cases, unfortunately. But eating disorders are really, really hard to treat. Crazy hard to treat. And the, the number, the percentage of people who die from them is tragically high. It's an incredibly difficult thing to treat. So the incentive for medical professionals to find something, anything they can treat and go, well, now we have more information. This is why he's not eating. He says this, let's go with it. They're not only going to get some treatment they can do and look like they're doing something, they're going to make a lot of money. And it's possible that Jacob will start eating again. It's also possible he won't. It's also possible he won't. This could be a comorbidity. It may not be cause effect, but they're not even pausing to think about that. You better care of him. I did call the therapist and they're going to get you in as soon as possible so that you can have an emergency family meeting. Okay. Um, is there anything else that he told you? Well, Jacob did let me know that the friends at school call her Amanda and that makes her really happy. Again, the kids at school call him Amanda and that makes him really happy. It's like, that's just not what I live for. I'm sorry. I mean, I want my kid to have friends, but this notion that parents should be swayed by what other people think, this is so regressive, especially what other teenagers think. Well, he's not getting bullied anymore and everybody is calling him by this female name and, you know, he's really happy about that and they understand him and, you know, you don't. Couldn't be that they're similarly disturbed and they, you know, misery wants company. We know that this is a social contagion. This is not news, but they act like, no, oh, these other kids are perfectly healthy and they're doing this thing and definitely they know more than mom. And she asked us to call her Amanda here today and she really wanted you to know because, you know, you love her and she wants you to help and you want to help. Okay, I'm not going to be able to do that right away. Not at all. But Go mom. <laughs> okay. I mean, oh, the, 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 the woman in this, I, I, at I, least I, they didn't make her out to be like, she's this horrible bigot mm -hmm. or whatever, but she's still... I mean, I would have been gone a long time ago. <laughs> I wouldn't get up in a huff or anything. I'd just be like, you know, when you guys can treat me, like I'm actually someone who does love Jacob. They're saying like, you love her. And did it, then treat me like I do. Treat me like I'm an equal partner in this care and not this person. You need to talk off the ledge and get me to come along with what you're saying. And I know it's going to be hard, but you're just going to have to do this. We're going to do it now. And the kids at school are doing it and everybody else is doing it. And the hundreds of other parents who have other kids, they're doing it. This is every stereotypical nice mean girl thing that bullies do. When they want to bully you, they don't want you to think that they're bullying you. They want to look like, no, I, what? I'm the nicest person. But it's bullying. Let's not kid ourselves. So that was the first thing that I saw. And I wanted to go through it with you guys so you could see, you know, it, it's bad enough you watch it. I'm sure those of you watch it, you're like, oh, God, this is terrible. But I like to, on this channel, I like to go through and explain specifically why at least from my point of view, you might disagree with me. That's totally fine. I just am saying from my point of view, this is what I hear. Maybe something will resonate. Maybe you'll hear something you missed. And, you know, here's the thing though. Usually I cover schools. So you might be saying, well, Deb, why are you covering hospitals? What's the deal? Well, there's an intersection between the schools and the medical centers and the hospitals. And they're now with the whole child, whole community mm -hmm. school thing. They want to actually attach clinics and medical facilities to schools physically. We also know that in many states, the it is now the law to affirm the child and begin the transition at the school and without telling the parent. And that too is another way that they're alienating the parents. We know that it starts as young as kindergarten when they say, what are your pronouns? What was your gender assigned at birth? And you say that to a young child. They're like, what do you mean assigned? 
Well, the doctor could be wrong. And they read books about how doctors get it wrong. Picture books went over one in one of the shows a couple weeks ago. So now the kid is going, mom and dad could have been wrong. Could have lied to me. Doctor lied to me. They don't know. It's something I get to choose and decide. I, I, the little kid would like, you know, I want to be a pirate and I, you know, whatever I, I'm deciding this. So the same, the same person who revealed the chop videos, this is Meg and Eileen. Then brought forth some information on how the gender clinics are infiltrating the schools. So there's more. We thought that was bad. There is more. Um, here we go. So this is Meg and Eileen. She says, how gender clinics infiltrate the schools. This week I shared training videos created by the CHOP Gender Sexuality Development Clinic. Let's learn more about its co-founder, Nadia Daushin, and the clinic's vision for education in schools. Of course they have a vision. Don't they all have a vision? They have a vision. So this is December 2018. Nadia spoke at NIH Women's Health Seminar Series. She explains that transgender patients must have a medical diagnosis to receive treatment. The diagnosis used is gender dysphoria. It appears transitioning a child is assumed as the gold standard of care for this diagnosis. Now, who gets to diagnose the child? The child. In other words, the child says, I'm trans. They go to a therapist who's now at this point, as I said, in some states, they're, it's required. They must affirm. It, the schools will begin to affirm. So by the time the kid gets to the therapist, it's pretty well like ingrained in them. They maybe they've been publicly affirmed by the teacher. They've been publicly affirmed by their peers. They're already keeping a secret from their mom and dad. So now there's this like a pretty big commitment to it. And they show up at the therapist's office. The therapist, has, the therapist has no choice but to affirm. And lo and behold, we have a diagnosis. We probably have hundreds of percent more diagnoses because we're doing it this way than we would have if it occurred more organically. So puberty blockers, that's the first step if the child is young enough, right? Starting a young child on puberty blockers is beneficial because this is a quote, it can delay irreversible secondary sex characteristics and can help a patient avoid top surgery. Avoid top surgery. These hormone treatments are expensive and can cost up to $40,000 a year. And the part that's, I'm going to play some of these because I don't know that there's really a way for you to fully appreciate environment the, in dis the US that disorder of this woman. Environment in the U.S. that in order to provide services for a young person, um, we have to have a diagnosis. So originally in the DSM, the language was gender identity disorder, which I think is quite pathologizing. Um, but if... It, and that's a problem why. Quite pathologizing. What is this hang up that these people have about taking something that's abnormal? And I think we can all agree that a, a, an individual born with all the chromosomes and biology, et cetera, of one sex who says, I don't want to be that sex. I don't want to, I don't want to identify that, that, that that's not normal. That is a disorder order would be, you know, it's not awesome in puberty, but you know, whatever. Don't want to be the other, the other. So why the squeamishness about making it a disorder? It's pathologizing. Ooh. Why do we don't, we don't say that about cancer. We don't say that about diabetes. We wouldn't, we don't, we don't do that. We don't, we don't say it about schizophrenia. Like what, what is the threshold where we say that it's okay to pathologize something? And why is there not a stigma attached to being, you know, if, if you say like it's a, it's pathologizing diabetes to call it a sickness, an illness, a disease. We're so hung up on the idea that people are stigmatized by being sick, especially mentally ill, that we are now normalizing things that, I mean, it, we're normalizing things we shouldn't be normalizing. We're stigmatizing normalcy. So let's see if I can get this to go back again. So this is characterized by, why is this not working? This happens all the time with Twitter. Um, so this is characterized. Twitter, which I think is yeah. quite pathologizing. 
Um, but it, it, from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5, we saw a change um, to gender dysphoria. And the criteria for that diagnosis are that a young person um, would have incongruence between their gender identity and their sex assigned at birth, as I mentioned earlier. They would have the desire to be rid of secondary sex characteristics of, of the sex they were assigned at birth and desire for those of the gender that they identify as. So in other words, they're a typical teenager going through puberty who is either a tomboy or they are more effeminate than a typical male and they feel uncomfortable about it. They don't neatly fit into one of the typical stereotypes or what their peers are doing or whatever. In many, many cases, as we know, they're either autistic or they've ADD or they've ADD and autism. So they're, they're a little bit behind in their maturity anyway. We know that clinically, that they mature emotionally more slowly. So they're not ready necessarily to have people look at them as sexual beings. They're not ready yet to transition from little kids where they're like borderline genderless into a person that, you know, uh, like other people are beginning to project expectations onto because of that gender. And that discomfort, that incongruence that they're describing, they're the ones pathologizing it. They're pathologizing it. They're pathologizing what is basically normal discomfort and calling it gender dysphoria or incongruence or whatever you want to call it. When previously, by the way, in order to get a diagnosis of gender identity disorder, it had to be really persistent, pervasive, and just so clinically di distressing that the person could, could just not function. Not a tomboy. Not a boy who likes to sew and cook and wear makeup. Okay. But we're talking about people who are just real, they can't get out of bed. They can't function. They're, they're truly suicidal. And we're also talking about a tiny, tiny percentage of the population, really small that would have that much discomfort. What they're now doing by depathologizing and making these, this, the symptoms be pretty much what most kids go through in puberty they are erasing gender nonconformity, which I thought we fought for decades to accept, right? And they're make they're pathologizing teenagerhood and puberty. They talk out of both sides of their mouths. Um, that they have a strong desire to be treated um, as the other gender, and that they have um, clinically significant distress. This last one is um, criteria is the most interesting to me because we're actually finally starting to see the first generation of transgender kids who they don't experience much distress. It's because they're not transgender. They're not, they, do you see what she just did? That sleight of hand? We're starting to see the first generation of transgender kids because they're not transgender kids. There's no such thing. By calling it transgender kids by making this thing called transgender what used to be gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder they've turned into another gender they've turned into this other category called transgender and now they're like well that explains why they don't have any clinical distress no what explains why they don't have clinical distress is they don't have a clinical diagnosis there's not anything wrong with them you are the ones who are now saying there's something that needs a medical treatment leave them the hell alone seriously and she's like because when they're three or four they start to say you know i'm a boy even though they're they don't start every kid does that i i i'm so incredibly sick of these extremely young people doctors teachers etc saying oh and there were three they said this i'm like who amongst us who has children has not had a child say there's something they're not mermaid, pirate, kitty cat, fairy, princess, king, tree, fish. I mean, any number of things. One of my daughters was a mermaid. Another one insisted, absolutely insisted she was a dragon in human form. She would explain it to me at length if I allowed it, you know, and I did. I let her, I was like, oh, please tell me more. Yes, mom, I know you don't understand. I mean, we're talking about like a seven or eight year old kid, but she's telling me with absolute seriousness, absolute seriousness, how she is a dragon. She had just read these books called Wings of Fire, very influenced by these books. 
would have felt such a kinship for these characters who were dragons, of course, anthropomorphized dragons, that she said, I believe that I am of dragon blood. I am just in human form. Went along with it, you know, good naturedly, like, okay, that's fascinating. Moving on. You know, like, I didn't say like, well, let's go pour some gasoline down your throat and light a match. I mean, and she's like, when they're three, they do this. And this is not, this is not healthcare. I don't know what this is. So then she talks about puberty blockers being beneficial and what it does. Delays irreversible secondary sex characteristics. Not a bad height reduction if started early. Not necessarily a bad thing. Unless you start thinking about why the height reduction happens. Because bone development doesn't happen. One of the things that puberty blockers do is reduce bone mass. That's why we're seeing, you know, young adults who've been on them who have osteoporosis. So severe that if they just bump themselves, they break a bone. They have chronic pain. Some of them. Um, this is not okay. This is like... These things are used to chemically castrate rapists. This is what caused, by the way, the side effects of this drug, Lupron in particular, are what caused Alan Turing to kill himself. They gave him a choice, prison, where he couldn't work on his AI stuff anymore, his, his computer stuff anymore, or chemical castration because he had been caught, as a homosexual man, he had been caught doing homosexual things horrific that that was even a thing. Okay. So they, they told him, you know, you can have, so he opted for chemical castration so we could at least work and not be in prison. But the side effects were so severe, horrible headaches, terrible physical problems and symptoms. And what good is, what good are you trying to work on your computer, you know, and programming and building the next computer, uh, the next generation of computers at such a, a, an early time? I think we're talking like the early 50s at this point. If you have chronic headaches, you can't function. And he committed suicide. We lost one of the greatest minds of the 20th century because of this drug. And they want to give it to children. I can assure you it's not been tested long-term on children for long-term side effects. And so when people talk about, well, do you want a dead kid? It's like, no, but you know what? I don't want a dead kid five years from now either. I don't want a kid who might die way younger than they ought to because they've gotten a cancer from hormone treatments. Because that's another thing you're going to face most likely if you take estrogen your whole flipping life and you weren't meant to. Or testosterone for that matter. They, there are side effects. These kids can't make these decisions. And the parents are increasingly told lies and or cut out of it. So now we get to the mission to infiltrate schools. It was clearly stated in a 2016 paper Nadia authored, every school district should develop and incorporate LGBT inclusive curriculum. Here is an, uh, an RTK email where a staff member of the gender clinic was begging to get training in schools. Begging to get training in the schools. Recommendation, enact state and local policies to ensure protections based on their, this expression. And extend the legal protections to youth in schools. Now, what does that mean for parental alienation? If a child is protected because they identify this way, that is the stepping stone to lying to parents. They mean protected from parents. Who else? Who else? They also mean protected from any other kind of clinician or doctor or whatever who might want to talk them out of it. It basically means go with whatever the kid wants. That's the protection. They now have rights outside of you, the parent. And she just writes about it like, this will be fine. Ensure that school districts develop and incorporate LGBT inclusive curriculum. Every school district should develop and incorporate this, you know, which at a minimum allows for a safe school environment by including positive representations of LGBT people and history in the curriculum, et cetera. Now, I have to ask this because not enough people have been asking this. I don't know when y'all went to school. I was in school in the late 70s and 80s, okay, K through 12. 
we didn't have rainbow flags. We didn't have positive representations of, you know, gay things and so forth and so on all over the school. And I mean, I, I fair, to be fair, I lived in the Northeast where your exposure to people who were gay was probably going to be higher than average. I lived, you know, outside New York City and spent a lot of time in New York City. So I, I probably, you know, saw more people who are gay. But even then, I don't recall personally knowing anybody who was gay or openly gay until high school, like ninth grade. OK. But I absolutely do not recall ever any kind of unsafe climate that in the sense that, you know, somebody would be afraid to just be themselves. Now that said, I know about Matthew Shepard and I know that there were places in the country where, you know, you couldn't just be yourself. And I do understand that. But what I don't understand is how we can't create a safe climate where everybody is accepted, whoever you are, without so much emphasis on one specific specific kind of way to be. So in other words, why can't we just say we don't, in this school, we do not mistreat people because of how they look, how they act, how they, what their preferences are, what their tastes are, what their hobbies are, what, you know, who they want to hang out with, who their friends are, what kind of grades they get. We just, do, there is no excuse. There is no excuse for mistreating your fellow students based on anything ever. There's like no, oh, well, we need to protect this characteristic, but those are okay. And singling it out like that tells students this is celebrated. This isn't just another thing that we, you know, that's not excuse, you're not excused from picking on people. And again, now we're 2022. The vast majority of Americans are either neither here nor there about gay marriage. They don't even poll it anymore. They're like, uh, okay, whatever, gay marriage. Nobody cares. We see gay couples all over. People adopt kids. They have kids. We know gay families. They're conflating trans issues and gender nonconformity and gender confusion and all of this with being gay. And they're going back in time to even really prior to when I was a kid to find you know, the specter of abuse and intolerance and hate and so forth and dredge it back up from whence it was, you know, buried a little bit, not completely, but mostly buried. They're sort of digging it back up again and bringing it front and center in order to justify these things in schools. Oh, we have to do this. And they added the T. And in my opinion, adding the T onto LGBT, like I said, it con it's conflating sexuality with gender, they're they're not related. They're they're not. Your gender identity and your sexuality are not. That, that's a totally different issue. And they're talking again. You know, teachers, guidance counselors, and school administrators keep, play a key role in supporting gender nonconforming youth. So we've now taken people who we thought were charged with teaching our kids knowledge, and so forth, skills. Now they're therapists. Now they're adjunct parents. Now they're charged with, you know, making sure everybody is inclusive and loves each other. And why? Nobody asked us. Nobody asked the parents, are you guys okay with this? With this level of emphasis on this one thing? And then we ever think, you know, I would prefer not to record. Maybe we could, I mean, again, memos, gender clinic. They don't want to record it. Why? Why don't they want to record this? We can teach pronouns to our kindergartners. Let's see some clips from one of the educational trainings offered by the Top Gender Clinic. The first is about teaching elementary kids pronouns. Has all of the rights that kids have to be themselves. So different books we can read to a classroom to help explain gender at a developmentally appropriate level might be read. There isn't one. They'll throw that in all the time. Developmentally appropriate level. This is so abstract and these kids are pre-sexual. So they definitely don't even understand about secondary sex characteristics or, you know, puberty or any of this. There isn't a developmentally appropriate way to talk to kindergartners about neo pronouns. You're manufacturing that out of thin air. A crayon story, which is about a crayon whose outside wrapper is red, but colors blue. Uh, we're talking just about expression. Jacob's new dress is a great one to help break down that 
the clothing we wear is just clothing. So Jacob is a boy who loves dresses. Just be break down. They accidentally tell the truth all the time. We can break down that clothing is just, you know, clothing. Yeah, that's true. It is just clothing. But every little thing that you do that you put to the kid, you put to the kid, you put it, is that the kid coming to you? It's let's tell you this. Let's tell you this. Let's tell you this. You are instigating thoughts. You're promoting concepts. You're promoting ideas. You're not responding. You're not creating a safe environment. You're certainly not creating a safe environment for the kid who just feels like who they are. They now feel like, well, special equals this kind of different because they're paying a lot of attention to it. If there's one thing that the kids pick up on, it's when the adults pay a lot of attention to something with smiley voices and, you know, this is great, is this is good. This is special. This is desirable. This is what they celebrate. This is what we notice as being extra wonderful. And then when they see these kids, not just included and accepted, like, hey, whatever, but like, oh, you, you're trans. Oh, you want to go by. I mean, they make such a big to do out of all of this with the flags and the months and the books. And where's the book about Jacob's new pair of pants? Jacob's new sneakers? Jacob's new baseball bat? Jacob's new... No, we don't have that. So we're celebrating the boy who wants to wear a dress. You don't think the kids are going to pick up on if I want to be celebrated or I want to be protected from people picking on me as just another boy. I'll wear a dress. Kids are pretty savvy. Because he wears dresses doesn't mean he's not a boy. And we can teach pronouns to our kindergartners. They, she, he, me, free to be is a great, great book. It's a great way to indoctrinate children when you give them rhymes. They don't understand pronouns because they don't know what a noun is. And they're not teaching pronouns correctly because the only purpose of pronouns is to replace nouns in such a way that it's a, it's like faster and easier for the listener, the writer, to, to speak, to communicate. It's meant to make communication simpler and easier, faster, clearer, not less clear. If somebody says they... They this and they that. I'm like, um, are we talking about more than one per one? Per I'm. It's confusing. To teach kids about pronouns. Anyway, so obviously you can see I disagree with all of that. And then another feature of the trading is teacher educate educators teaching educators how to eliminate gender from their communication in classrooms. So they don't use. They say friends. Good morning, friends. They don't say boys and girls ever, but they haven't done that for a long time. But, um, you know, this is what they do. Gender neutral language, assigning students to groups. They're spending so much effort on this. They want to create a, a genderless society. That's the message here. This isn't about inclusion. This isn't about making sure the kid who's a little confused doesn't feel left out. This is about eliminating the concept of gender completely. This is about queering your kids. And of course, by definition, this is about alienating them from their parents and creating a separate, special, unique place at school where the kids feel safe only because it's familiar. It's what they know as the only place where this goes on. They, for in a child's life, this is really going to be the only place this goes on unless they're in organized school-like activities all day, every day, all the time. And unless you and your home are starting to refer to everybody you know as genderless. But most families don't do that. You refer to some, you refer to your son, your daughter, your grandson, granddaughter, he, she, the, if just, you, you, the, you will end up, if they have their way, you will change, not them. You will be alienated or you will change. Those are the two choices that you get because they have them eight hours a day and you don't. All the other kids, remember all the other kids, all the other, not all, but you know, there are lots of other, there are hundreds of other people. My friends are calling me this name. That's how the parents get alienated. Gender identity is considered confidential and private information. When we get this information, we keep it private from other students, staff members, and from parents. Yep. It's all in there. If all the treatment is based on a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, why is transitioning the child seen as the best treatment? 
Medicine used to assume parents were the child's expert. Why are parents who challenge this course of treatment portrayed as adversarial and non-supportive? Because we are. Because we know what this is really about. And this is really about creating people for this ideology and this revolution. It's not about respecting our own individual children, the unique individuals that they are. And this gets this gets bad too in terms of therapists. I'm going to show you this one. You don't know how to keep your business clean. I don't know if you guys can see this. So this is a licensed therapist. Me, your AF, here to validate your feelings. As a therapist who saw this video and feels very disgusted by it, I have a few things to say. First of all, Lumping homophobia and transphobia is misleading in of itself. They're not the same thing. And most parents who are struggling with kids who have trans identities lean left and don't have any trouble with homophobia or transphobia. Just because a parent has questions about a child that they've known their whole life and their identities does not make them transphobic. Even if the parents were bigots or terrible, as this therapist implies, this is still unethical to split up families and to tear the kid away from the child. Even the bad parents need to work together with the therapist. Splitting a child from their parents is dangerous and harmful to their mental health. Yes. And he wants to talk about oppression and teach the child that they're a victim, not therapeutic. This is all why I wrote a parent's guide to mental health. Check it out in my bio. Yes, and you should check it out in her bio. This is my friend, Pamela. This is the truthful therapist. She is on um, Twitter and Instagram. And this is the website that she has created. So if you or anybody else needs this information, I encourage you to pass this along because it is chock full of fantastic information. And it's really um, people like her are a treasure at this point because so many people in the mental health profession have had to just go along with it. If they want to keep their license, they want to keep their jobs, they are going along with the affirmation model. She is not. And so she has like a bunch of materials and there's lessons in here. There's all kinds of things to help you learn you know, how to deal with this. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you, this is Colin Wright. You may be familiar with him. And he reported last week, Amy Tishelman, lead author of the child chapter in WPATHW Path, which I think is funny because it's sort of like war path. <laughs> How fitting. Uh, their new guidelines, she admits that minimum age recommendations for gender affirming hormones and surgeries were removed so that practitioners could not be sued because they weren't following exactly what we said. And I'm going to play this for you for the sole reason that I want you to hear then, how matter-of-factly she says that. We w were thinking, and it was scary for me, about the potential uses of the chapter for legal and insurance contexts. Again, what we didn't want to do was create a chapter that would make it more likely that practitioners would be sued because they weren't following exactly what we said. We wanted there to be some clinician judgment without being at risk. Or we wanted there to be some clinician judgment. So even though we know that these drugs and these surgeries can cause permanent damage, well, we know the surgeries are permanent and that the drugs can cause permanent damage, they do. I mean, they permanently alter each other. They sterilize them. And they, instead of making age recommendations, these are minor children. They're like, well, we want them to have judgment. And so we removed those years. We removed the recommendations so people can get sued. For the record, there are over a thousand people in the UK right now suing the gender clinic there because they were damaged severely there were, i think at last time i checked i think i heard there were about forty thousand detransitioners transitioners reporting all manner of problems and they can't bubble this up to the surface because it's considered you know hateful and all this other stuff so and, and they're they're threatened they get death threats 
And then you have people like this. Well, we don't want people to get sued. You should be sued. You should be in prison. So then he says, um, then uh, Christina Buttons also has some great information. You should follow her as well. Um, she is a full report on the removal of the age recommendations and their new guidelines. So you can go to the Daily Wire and read that. And this is WPATH World Professional Association for Transgender Health. This is an oxymoron if I ever heard one. But um, yeah, scientific symposium. This just happened. And you can find a provider. Look, featured announcements. I mean, look at how many people. Like, why do we need this? This is very concerning. Um, then I want to bring to your attention um, a piece of legislation. Senator Tim Scott has introduced a bill to ban schools from keeping the child's gender transition a secret from parents. Thank you. And people are saying, you know, oh, it's not for the federal government to do. Well, oh, well, I personally don't think it's for the government to educate kids in the first place. So, you know, once we're already in the government's educating kids business, I think then it's the least we can do to have some laws protecting parental rights so that the school, the state, in this particular case, that gets federal money, and that's what this bill is about. It's about preventing them from getting federal money if they lie to parents. If they conceal this stuff from parents and violate parental rights, no, you should not get federal money. I'm 100% behind that. And I'm the, the last person you'll ever see supporting federal legislation to you know ban things or whatever. But this isn't really, it isn't even so much banning them from keeping the child's gender transition a secret. It's saying, if you do, New Jersey, California, and other states, Maryland, etc. Rhode Island. There, it, I mean, I lost count at this point. If you're going to do that, if that's your policy, you're not getting federal dollars. Now, it's not going to win. It's not. It's not going to get passed. We know that. But he's drawn a line in the sand and said we should not be funding that. We should not be funding schools that lie to parents. And I thank him for it. And I agree with that. And I categorically reject the accusations that he's, you know, a transphobe and he hates people and all these other things. And I'm, I'm not usually a political person, but I will tell you right now that somebody's got to do something like this because these are our tax dollars paying people to lie to us and get between us and our kids. That's why my kids are not in the schools, but I'm here telling you guys because I don't want yours there either. But if they have to be there, you need to know. You need to know. Um, so yeah, that should go without saying. Uh, this is more from, you know, CHOP. This is the supporting transgender, gender expansive students. There's like a whole presentation about it. And again, the thing with all of these presentations is this tone of their voice is so sing-songy. History will not be kind. Um, this is a podcast that I'm going to give you the link to. I hope that you will all listen to it at some point. Um, again, I'll put it in the description after the show, but this, I hope this is the right one. This podcast of uh, the dark history of transgender medicine is so fascinating to me. Um, in, in this case, what, let me find the exact, the exact thing. Okay. This is the, the story. It's, it's horrific, really. But <sighs> WPATH, the organization I just showed you, has connection to this person, London Eunuch Maker. This was a queer activist and leading gender diversity uh, organization. Okay. I'm not going to read this to you because it's so incredibly, incredibly disturbing. Um, but I will tell you that, by the way, this is the BDSM and fetish flag. What these organizations did, and we're talking early 2000s, is they legitimized all kinds of fetishes, paraphilias, et cetera. And remember she talked about, you know, oh, they're just pathologizing the gender dysphoria. They wanted their fetishes and BDSM and sexual fan, like sadomasochistic fantasies and everything removed from the DSM as disorders and turned instead into, you know, something akin to being gay. 
they go, yeah, I'm into watching people, you know, I, it turns me on to see people in pain is according to them really just the same as, you know, being gay or being bisexual or something. Super excited. They have a flag, right? So in 2018, when they revised these uh, documents um, and the World Health Organization guidelines, they were, you know, they re they removed, it says the initial by LL LLH FRI was called revised F65 in reference to the classification category designated by the WHO's ICD guidelines listed under F65 and version 10 were disorders of sexual preference, fetishism, transvestism, Vestic fetishism, sadomasochism, voyeurism, and pedophilia. The ICD-10 defines paraphilia as sexual urges, fantasies, or behaviors generally involving themes of suffering, humiliation, sexual activity with non-consenting partners, with non-consenting partners, or an orientation towards non-human objects for sexual arousal. Okay? So then during a revision process overseen by academics, overseen by academics, who supported the depathologization, pathologization, I think I said it right, and re, um, where was it, of paraphilias, the term gender identity disorder was declassified as such and reconceptualized as gender incongruence. And you'll start seeing these terms, gender incongruence instead of dysphoria. It used to be gender identity disorder. Now it's gender incongruence or dysphoria, and but they like this one better. And now they're going to gender expansive. The less that it's pathologized, the better as far as they're concerned. Ironically, the, the gold standard of treatment is medicalization. Why are we medicalizing something that's a preference? Why, if it's your preference, why do you need surgeries and drugs? And I'm telling you, you, you legitimize this. You're going to get to a point where you've legitimized removal of body parts, like other body parts. You are going to legitimize, and insurance needing to cover it. Somebody asked today, well, if I don't feel feminine enough because I have small breasts, should my insurance cover my breast augmentation so that I can feel properly feminine? Why not? If it must cover these surgeries and these drugs, why shouldn't it cover taking more estrogen and having breast augmentation surgery? Liposuction to remove, you know, the fat from where I don't want it and put it where I do want it so I can have bigger hips or whatever. What, what, why not? I don't feel sufficiently feminine if I have extra wrinkles. Can I go have a facelift? I mean, where does this end? And at what point are we going to say, you know, maybe as a society, we need to deal with the disorder of not being satisfied with what you are and what you have. Maybe there's something wrong with a people and a culture where we feel like we need to transform ourselves in every possible way in order to be happy. Because I get news for you. These people are still not happy. Um, and so, yeah, they revised it and where they're working their way towards revising things to get rid of pedophilia as well. But all of these things, this guy, this Gustafson guy who perform himself performed castrations. He was a eunuch maker. He was also a cannibal. I'll leave you to fill in the blanks. Um, but yeah, the termination, the ter terminology Nello and Cutter. This is what these sites talk about. This is who these people are. And uh, these people, these organizations have a lot of power. They're influential in WPATH. They're influential in pushing for these paraphilias to be normalized and depathologized. They're pushing really hard for all these tran the, the trans stuff in the schools, for the trans stuff and, you know, the trainings to like get parents on board and all that and get a load of this. One outspoken member of FRI. Now let's, let me see what, what FRI is. Um, I forgot what it is, but anyway, one outspoken member, Christine Marie Gentoft, a man who identifies as a lesbian woman, filed hate crime charges in May against Christina Ellingson for stating that men can neither be lesbians nor mothers. If convicted, Christina Ellingson of Women's Declaration International faces up to three years in prison for stating facts. That a woman can neither be a lesbian nor a mother. And these are the people who want to have private conversations with our children. 
It's people who agree with this and think this is great. They want to have private conversations with our kids. And the last couple of things I want to show you but to show you how to like how far into schools this is getting or how insidious this is. This comes to us um, from Alexis. She says, PSEA Southeastern Region. This is um, like a union organization. Professional Development, Gender Queer, a book which includes, I'm not reading that, Tinder Journeys, Fellatio, The Strap, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Pleasuring Yourself While Driving. That's in that book. Okay. So what they're, they're doing is having these classes for what they call uh, micro, I think they're calling them micro credentials. You can get like these micro credentials in your training. This one is going to be reading and discussing the book aloud and an educator can get a micro credential for that. That can get paid for, that gets paid for as, you know, part of their professional development with the district. They'll get credit for that, for taking this class. And then we have this, this is this month, September and October. Here are the micro, here are more micro credentials that they can get. Competency-based recognitions of professional skills, job integrated professional learning experiences, et cetera, and so forth. They're going to get credentials as teachers for knowing about this stuff. Okay, that's one thing. And then the last thing is this. The New Jersey Department of Education threatens teachers with discipline if they refuse to teach children about anal sex. They have to do it as part of sex ed. So yes, teachers are quitting. Not enough but they are. And where are parents in all of this? Well, we're alienated, right? We're not even told about it unless we go out on the internet and look at this. And guess what happens when we say, no, this is not okay. We're extremists. We're bad people. We're the problem. So that pretty much concludes what I wanted to tell you today about parental alienation at the doctor's office and in the school. They're connected. They're now connected. It's largely around this issue of trans. Um, you know my stance on it. There are no trans kids. There are kids who have various forms of mental illness, identity disorders, um, just problems with growing up. They may be dealing with depression. They may be dealing with eating disorders, they may be dealing with a lot of things. And we've now seen how professionals deal with them where they jump to the conclusion or they're only too happy to have new information, new information that this may be connected to gender because they can medicalize them. And one year of hormonal treatment is $40,000. Now imagine the kid has to take it for the rest of their life. It's a lot of money. Do they even stop and think about the fact that at some point these kids are not going to be on mom and dad's insurance? And if they have medical complications, whether it's from surgeries or just, you know what, this didn't fix them. They're more mentally ill after than they were before. And you didn't let mom and dad help. So now they've maybe alienated their parents. They've alienated their family. They are sterile. They're not any happier than they were before. You failed to treat them. You validated them when they were teenagers and didn't know what the hell they were doing. So you're, you're culpable. You've abused them, in my opinion. And now that you've done that, you've done all that wonderful work. They have trouble getting a job and working, in, you know, to, to take care of their medical needs. And now where are they? Who's taking care of them now? It's, it's, it's all fun and games until they are grown up adults and need to take care of themselves. And they have, they are so scarred and they have so many problems and we haven't even begun to see the ramifications of this yet. As I said, this is still relatively new and we already have 40,000 detransitioners desperately trying to tell their stories and prevent this from happening to other people. What's it going to be in 10 years? Do you even want to know? I don't. Anyway, that's what I have for you. Thank you so much for watching. As always, uh, please like, share, subscribe. And if you are of a mind to support my work, there are many ways you can do it. There are links up above. I have local, subscribe, star, Patreon, uh, Substack. Every bit helps. Producing one of these shows it takes a long time. And I really do appreciate it. The other thing I wanted to put out there to you guys, if you could spread the word, is I am a private tutor. <laughs> I do tutor kids, uh, writing, college essays, um, middle school, ELA, history, things like that. I don't do math. Don't do the hard sciences. I can do like biology and middle school and stuff like that. But mostly writing, English, that type of stuff. So if you or anyone you know is looking for a tutor 
or just want some extra above and beyond what the school's teaching because school's not teaching them much of anything, uh, send them my way because I do do that privately and I have slots. So slots opened for new students. So anyway, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your evening. Take it easy, you guys.